So I want to thank everyone for being here today. This is my first time doing one of these webinars, so bear with me as I kind of feel this out today. Um, like I said before, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the questions box. We'll get to them at the end. So welcome to the 2024-2025 Winter Outlook. This is specifically for Eastern North Dakota and Northwest Minnesota. That is the Grand Forks area of responsibility. Kind of wanted to start out with some changes that's going to be coming this winter. Um, we are getting rid of wind chill watches, extreme cold watches. Those are being consolidated into the extreme cold watch. Uh, wind chill warnings and extreme cold warnings consolidated into an extreme cold warning. And that wind chill advisory is changing to a cold weather advisory. Kind of the why here is to improve those messaging scenarios and get rid of some of the uncertainty and miscommunication of what each thing means. Cold is cold, it doesn't really matter about the wind. We're just trying to communicate that aspect of it here. So kind of what our thresholds here, here are up in the Northern Plains, specifically East North Dakota, Northwest Minnesota. Um, we're looking for that minus 30 wind chill or temperature for a cold weather advisory, and then minus 40 for temperature or wind chill for extreme cold warning. As we kind of get into the winter outlook portion here, beyond just changes to our products, kind of the big factor in the winter outlook most years is Enzo or specifically El Nino or La Nina. So what is that? Enzo is defined as the El Nino Southern Oscillation. It's really just a climate pattern based off sea surface temperatures, kind of extending off the Chilean and Ecuador coast of Central America and down into South America, extending over into the Central Pacific, all the way over to Papua New Guinea, actually, in the Western Pacific. So it's really the interaction of cold or warm ocean waters and what that means for thunderstorms in the tropics. Why that matters as much is where the jet stream sets up in relation to those thunderstorms. During an El Nino, it would typically set up a little further south, resulting in precip kind of along the California and Arizona area, versus in a La Nina, it would set up more over the Gulf of Alaska and Western Canada, bringing colder and wetter conditions to the northern US. So kind of just a graphical depiction of that here. We are expecting a La Nina or close to that this winter. Um, what that means, we're gonna see more of a variable polar jet kind of setting up across the Gulf of Alaska, arcing through British Columbia and coming down through the northern Intermountain West and Northern Plains, kind of bringing some of that colder Canadian air down into our area specifically maybe a little more pronounced as you head out west into Bismarck's area in the western part of the state and out into Montana. They might get a little worse of the colder air, but we'll still definitely be in the core of it at times. La Nina is defined as that cold water anomaly off the Western Americas as greater than a negative 0.5 degree Celsius deviation from the 1991 to 2020 average. So, it's not looking at the whole period back to say 1950 or 1900, it's just that 30 year climatology here. Typically we would see stronger trade winds off the Central American coast become even stronger than they typically would be because of that stronger cold water anomaly. We're seeing general sinking in the Eastern Pacific and general rising in the Western Pacific, creating a little bit of a circulation down there. Meanwhile, that increases and aids in a positive feedback loop, upwelling colder water off the eastern Pacific shelf and bringing that back to the surface. This does result in a stronger Pacific stream jet with more winter storms into the northern United States and less in the southern United States, kind of why we see that drier pattern in the south and wetter generally in the northern tier of the U.S. So what are we really expecting here in terms of numbers this year? Well, right now, we're sitting somewhere in the middle of a La Nina and El Nino. We're still technically in an Angelo neutral phase with that anomaly sitting at negative 0.15 Celsius. There is a 60% chance that we do transition into a La Nina by the end of November for that September, October, November timeframe. That's what these letters mean here at the bottom. So this would be October, November, December, so on and so forth. So as we head into that peak winter season, we're looking at around a 60 to 70% chance for a La Nina to truly develop by the time we hit the peak of winter, with by the time we even get into those spring months of February, March, April, and May, we're looking at more of a transition back to an Enzo neutral phase. So more of what we're currently in. So this will be a rather short-lived La Nina, possibly a very weak La Nina. Uh, what that has for implications on our area is mean 
going to kind of mean that some of the effects are a little more muted. They won't be as exaggerated as if we had a really strong La Nina or a really strong El Nino. The correlations just kind of fall apart and stuff gets a little more murky and falls a little more closely to climatology per se. So with La Nina, we typically expect a pretty dry and warm fall ahead of La Nina winter. So as we've been seeing recently, we've been seeing a lot of highs in the 70s and 80s, which is not particularly normal this time of year. Normal right now would be around maybe 50 to 60, somewhere in there for average highs. Uh, reminder that ENZO is just one climate factor that can dictate the expected pattern. There are various others, but they typically determine your weather on a shorter time scale. Usually these are better predictors on the order of a couple weeks to a month rather than ENZO, which gives you a more heads up in terms of seasons to six months in advance. What specifically are we looking at in terms of probabilities here? and more of a plume-based forecast to kind of convey some of that uncertainty. Right here, you can see in this kind of darker box, um, I have outlined the 15th to 85th percentile forecast for where that line could track in terms of sea, set, sea surface temperature anomalies over the next couple of months here. So with this, we would see a maintenance of that enzo neutral negative phase or development of a weak La Nina somewhere in that negative 0.5 to negative 0.1 anomaly range. Um, what that really means for a winter, we'll continue to discuss here, but it's not looking to be a strong event this year at all. You'll kind of continue to see me reiterate that as we get through this. Oh, sound. Okay. So as we kind of look into the upcoming short term here, looking into the six to 10 day temperature outlook, we can see that we are looking well above normal here in terms of probs for above normal temps, somewhere in that 60 to 80% frame. So there is still a chance that we could be below normal, in fact, we probably will see a day or two below normal in terms of max temps. As we get into the later portions of the month, those probs do continue to trend down. We see more of a return to average. In terms of free sip, it would be very welcome. We have been in a developing drought here the last couple of weeks. Uh, we do have some D1, D2, and even some D3 creeping into the western part of our area over in Beltrami and Wadena counties. Um, so seeing some of those 40 to 50% chances for above average precip here in the next six to, 10 to, six to 10 days would be very welcome. Whether we see a quarter inch or an inch is very uncertain at this time. That'll come into focus as any event possibly comes near in the forecast. And kind of breaking that down in terms of just specific percents, we do have a 66% chance to remain above average overall through that six to 10 day period. At Grand Fork specifically with that also reflected in a 3% three three chance for below normal temps during that period. And kind of also looking at what those normal temperatures are, a normal high would be 46 with a normal low of 28. And on the similar time frame and similar scale of precipitation, we are looking at around a quarter inch over that time frame would be normal. So pretty equal chances across the board there for precip, but we are leaning slightly above normal for above average precip, meaning more than that 0.22 inches. Looking into November, we do see those probabilities drop off dramatically. We start to see above normal temps at a 30 to 40% confidence interval with equal chances across the board of above or below normal precip through the month of November. Kind of following that trend of well above normal temperatures through the early fall and then kind of transitioning more into a typical winter pattern come December and January. Looking at those probs again, we do see pretty equal chances across the board for all things ranging from temperature to precip. So what are our normals this time of year? Well, starting in October, normal highs would be around 60 degrees with by the end of November, those normal highs would be somewhere in the upper 20s for Grand Forks. As you move across the area, say Devil's Lake, Park Rapids, Lake of the Woods, Fargo, you could deviate probably plus or minus five degrees from any of these numbers. And then also for precip, 
average precip through the month of October does dramatically drop off into November, dropping from two inches to 83 hundredths by November. So we do get remarkably drier as we head into the winter season, as we would kind of expect. We're not seeing four inches like we would in June or July. For the official winter outlook here, we do have the CPC outlook. We are looking at below normal or increased chances for below normal temperatures through December, January, and February, meaning that we are looking at a 33 to 50% chance across parts of the area for below normal temperatures. This doesn't mean that we will be constantly below normal. It doesn't mean temperatures will be minus 30 in December. It just means that we are favoring a trend over that period of below normal temperatures. Shifting over to precip, mostly equal chances as we look in Eastern North Dakota, a little leaning slightly above average for precip chances as we head into Northwest Minnesota. Looking into the next lead, January, February, March, we continue to see more of the same below normal or chances for below normal temperatures are on the kind of leaning above average confidence here over the area with a little more of that drawback from precip chances into that lead. Continuing to head through the winter into February, March, April timeframe, more of the same chance Increased chances for below normal temperatures, equal chances across the board for precip, snowfall. They're not as necessarily one and the same, but they do typically correlate to some degree, obviously. Looking at March, April, May, we see the retraction of those below normal chances or chances for below normal temperatures. And we really start to see equal chances across the board for precip, almost everywhere in the CONUS actually, the Great Lakes being the one exception for above normal precip and the desert southwest and parts of Florida being the exception for below normal precip. So what does a typical La Nina give us here in this part of the country? Well, running the stats on weak La Ninas being that negative 0.5 to negative 0.1 degree anomaly across that part of the ocean. We do see 12 years here that fit that criteria across the board typically below average in terms of temperature, but we do see a couple anomalies such as 1974 and especially 2011, even including 2005, 2006, where we did see greater than average temperatures across that December, January, February timeframe. So it's not a given that will be below average, but the majority of years with a weak or strong La Nina do tend to show that negative temperature correlation kind of showing what that looks like here in terms of October, November, and then moving into the actual winter months, we do see that reflection of aggressively above average temperatures through the fall, shifting quickly to those below average temperatures. And this is a composite of all those years in the previous slide for the climate divisions. So not a perfect map, but it does kind of paint the picture of, we do shift quickly from much above average to typically trending below average temperatures for that time frame. And then typical La Nina for specifically weak La Ninas, the last slide was encompassing all, all La Ninas, so it could be something much stronger than what we're expecting this year. We do see a little more muted on the correlation side of things. We do see slightly less above average temperatures in the fall, shifting to slightly less below average temperatures for the winter. So it might not be as much of a drastic swing as it possibly could be, but we're still looking to swing from the 60s and 70s that we have been seeing too quickly more of the 20s and 30s that would be typical of that time frame of the year. So it's probably not gonna be a long lasting fall by any means where there's, there's this really smooth transition. So it might come as a shock to some people, especially in the public. Moving on to the precip side of things, we do see all the similar years here. There is much less of a correlation between La Nina and precip between one amounts and two deviation from normal. Um, you can pick out any given year here pretty much and you'll see that part of the area is probably split between above average and below average precip one of the main anomalies is actually 2022 2023 where almost the entire northern plains was above average in terms of precip you do obviously see the exceptions like 1964 65 where the better part of north dakota south dakota and minnesota were all well below precip for normal over the period Kind of taking the aerial average of those and putting them all together we can see these are all la nina so not just the weak la nina that we're expecting again but we do see the majority 
16 to 20 out of 28 did show above average precipitation over the winter, that December, January, February timeframe. And then percent of average precip out of those La Ninas, we were looking somewhere just slightly above average. So if average is say two to three inches, we may be looking at three and a half inches. So not grossly exceeding, we're not doubling our yearly or seasonal precip by any means, but we are looking to be above average more or less. Kind of taking a different perspective on that, we do see the correlation between El Nino neutral and La Nina is very muted. There's really not much of a difference on these box and whiskers from December, January, February across Eastern North Dakota, and Northwest Minnesota. Usually we get very similar precip across all phases of Enzo, but once we move into the spring timeframe, we do see a much better correlation and in increased precip during an Enzo neutral phase or La Nina. So this kind of lends confidence into a maybe relatively quiet early start to winter, but a shift into a more active period come maybe that February, March, April timeframe. What are some other factors that might come into play with this relatively weaker La Nina that we're expecting this year? Uh, you got things like the Madden Julian oscillation, the Arctic oscillation, the North Atlantic oscillation, which is really just a subset and specifically focused on the North Atlantic part of the Arctic oscillation. We have the polar vortex, which you'll hear referenced numerous times throughout the winter during those major cold outbreaks, where it's really a weakening of that polar jet that lets cold air escape into more southern latitudes. Uh, we have atmospheric Rosby waves, which is more of what you see driving those um, California pineapple expresses with that really amplified jet. So that's what will give us our really stagnant patterns with really amplified weather. It'll vary a lot week to week, but if you have that really stable jet, we're probably just gonna be locked in more of the same kind of pattern for a week or two at a time. You also have your southern stratospheric warming. So what also, those also kind of play into polar vortex to some degree, but they are slightly different. You'll see more of those Arctic air intrusions from a southern stratospheric warming event, which typically hold a couple weeks lead time. So what are we really expecting here this winter specifically? This is a machine learning model that was developed by one of our forecasters here. Um, kind of defining what a major winter storm is for our area specifically, we looked at a storm that's really impacting half of our area. So say the Northwest quarter of Minnesota for a 24 hour period would be defined as a major winter storm if it's continuously under impact from some type of winter event. Notably, this does not include freezing drizzle events or ice storms. So this event wouldn't have captured the Christmas ice storm of last year per se. So average for the November to March timeframe in terms of major winter storms in quotes, granted there are a lot of caveats to this outlook. We haven't completely tested it. This is kind of a first look at it. We're gonna see how it plays out this year. Um, average would be two to three events. So if we had three ice storms last year, those wouldn't have been factored into this. But if we had three major long duration blizzards, that probably would have been an average winter for us. Kind of what's the high end in this? We're looking at maybe nine, 10 events somewhere in there. If we saw 10 events impacting half of, or the Northwest quarter of Minnesota, or kind of that Eastern third of North Dakota, that would be the high end of this forecast. What's expected? Maybe somewhere in the four to six range. Um, so maybe double an average winter. We're not looking at anything too dramatic, but we're also not looking at a particularly quiet winter like last year for instance. And then kind of the low end, low end chance of what we're pretty sure we're gonna get, we're probably gonna have at least two major winter storms, winter blizzards, something of that nature. So minimum turns out to be an average winter. So kind of the overall story of this winter, it's not gonna be the record cold and extreme snowy winter of two years ago, but it's also not gonna be the super warm and super dry winter of last year, somewhere in between. Kind of looking at the monthly probs for what we could see in terms of storms, probably gonna be a pretty quiet November. I'm not gonna say there's not gonna be some flurries or a one inch snowstorm, but that also wouldn't qualify as a major winter impact. As we head into December, January, February, those probabilities do take up quite a noticeable amount, obviously, as you can see here. Um, looking out towards March or even April per se, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily less of a chance of a major storm, but 
as the model runs, it probably deviates a little back towards climatology, loses confidence, some of those things that it just doesn't have the predictability to say that there is an increased chance of a major winter storm come that time of the year. And with that, that is all the information that I have to share with you guys today. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the questions box. Um, this will be sent out to everyone afterwards. It is being recorded, obviously. So if you have any questions later on, feel free to watch that and send me an email afterwards as well. I'm not seeing any questions in there. I did see Robert's comment in there earlier about with this weather pattern, are ice storms less likely? Not necessarily. Um, I can say from a climatology standpoint, an ice storm like last year is about a once in a seven year event. So with that logic, there's about a 16% chance any given year that we could see another event like that. Obviously, we're not saying that it would happen. It would be similar logic of a one in a hundred year flood. We're not saying that a one in a hundred year flood is gonna happen every year, but there's a one in a hundred, there's a one in a hundred chance that it could happen any given year. So I hope that kind of answers your question, but from forecast perspective, we obviously can't know that right off the bat. Name and title, my name is Tyler Thomas. I'm a meteorologist here at the Grand Forks National Weather Service. Are there any plans to bring back the monthly outlook recap email packet? Uh, we're not looking to specifically bring back the monthly outlook, George, but we are looking to do a seasonal one that kind of outlines some of the climate patterns over the last couple of months, maybe some records that were broken, some average stats over the period of how above or below average we were for the time frame, as long as highlighting some things that our office has done in that time. So kind of packaging it all together in maybe a three to five page document. Any other questions that we have here? I know I blitzed through a lot of that pretty fast, so I'm sure some of you guys will have questions, but if you don't, we appreciate you jumping on today. With that, I'll stop the recording. I'll stay here for a couple more minutes in case anyone wants to ask a question not in front of the crowd.